Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Chooses podcast. Today we have with us Jill Cook, a physiotherapist in Australia, an educator and one of the world leaders in tendinopathy rehabilitation and research. Uh, Jill, given sort of a tiny little nutshell, why don't you uh, take a couple minutes and tell us who you are, what it is you do, and then we can dive on into the murky waters of tendinopathy. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm a clinician researcher, which I think is really important that you have a foot in each camp. Uh, my area does include tendons, but of course, once you're a researcher, you tend to expand a little bit. So we have students doing research in other areas, but mostly musculoskeletal medicine and mostly in activity. So activity-based um, uh, programs of research. Uh, started this ridiculously working with a basketball team, men's basketball team in the early 90s and had athletes with patella tendinopathy and had no idea how to treat them, went to the literature, found nothing and thought, oh, maybe we could look at this and started some bad research and then got picked up by Karim Khan, fortunately, as a student and um, finished my PhD. And that was a long time ago. And I can't believe 20 years later, I'm still doing it. I think, interestingly, we're much, much better now than we were when I started at diagnosing and managing tendons. But my goodness, there's still so much we don't know. Now, obviously, you've, you've taken a fair chunk of your physio career to, to be looking at this. And you're working with the men's basketball team that's quite an active bunch of people, probably going to be training quite often explosive sport. How is it generally that this sort of injury would occur? That's such a complex, seems like a simple question, but such a complex question. So what we know from most tendons in the lower limb, and I'm not talking about shoulder or elbow here because that's not my area of expertise, but most, in the, most tendons in the lower limb accumulate pathology with load. That is, the more you load and the longer you load, as in the number of years you load, the more likely you are to have a pathology in your tendon. So this is what we call a load accumulation disease. So there's some very good studies that show that if you are active through your life, you are more likely to have pathology in your tendon. If you're less active, you're less likely. So that's talking about the pathology. The exception to that rule appears to be the patella tendon, and we can expand on that if you need. But mostly it's about a load accumulation disease. Where we get into trouble is the poor correlation between pathology and the tendon and symptoms. So the first thing is, to have tendon symptoms, you have to have pathology. But if you have pathology, you don't have to have symptoms. So there's a, a big uh, group of people in the population that have Achilles tendon pathology, but will never get a symptom in their life. So what brings on the pathology? Load accumulation mostly, except for the patella tendon. What brings on pain is some sort of overload outside of tendon capacity in a person with pathology. Now, I'm sure it's something that we'd touch on with the whole donut model, but then what you've just said would indicate that people will have the pathology in terms of what's going on within the tendon, but not show and potentially never develop any pain or issue, right? That's right. What are then the potential different stages that we may see in a tendon? And if there is potential for this to develop without symptoms or for symptoms to be there without anything else, or yeah. So in terms of the pathology developing, there's quite a few theories. There's probably seven or eight different theories how it develops, and we don't actually know. Um, but we firmly believe that it's not an inflammatory-driven condition, that it's not a collagen-tearing condition, that it's a cell-based condition, that is, the cells are within the tendon matrix, which is primarily collagen. They know when the tendon is loaded and they respond to load. Now, if you load them within the capacity, within what they're used to, then it becomes just, a, the cells become just maintenance men. They just repair the tendon as necessary. If you exceed the load the tendon is used to, then the cells will respond and their response is, not a normal response. They become more chondrocytic. That is, they round up, they start to excrete different proteins and then the matrix starts to change. Now, if that's, and that's what we sort of 
call a, a reactive tendon in the early stages. If the uh, changes continue, that is you continue to load in a way that the tendon's not happy with or not able to deal with, then you start to see the changes in the collagen matrix. Once you see the changes in the collagen matrix, it becomes an irreversible condition. So while the collagen matrix is intact, it's reversible, reactive tendon. Once we get into disrepaired degenerative tendon, where we have enough cell-driven change, enough protein differences in the tendon to disrupt the collagen, then we start to see an, uh, an irreparable condition, which is the degenerative tendon pathology. What sort of risk factors then should we look for as clinicians to know whether we're going to be dealing with someone who may be in a reactive or in a disrepair or in a degenerative tendon sort of phase? Yeah. So you don't need imaging to identify these people. Reactive, true reactive tendon is actually very uncommon. We see it in younger people because it's very much a cell-driven response and younger people have much more sort of uh, vital cells if you want to look at it that, from that perspective. Acute bout of overload. So people who train two or three times a week go to a sort of an elite camp, train two or three times a day for a week. That's sort of substantial change in load in a young person will induce a reactive tendon. The other way we see it across the population is more with a direct blow. So if you hit a tendon pretty hard, you can actually get a reactive tendon. So they would be the two scenarios where it's reactive. Pretty much everyone else is going to be have a degenerative underlying degenerative pathology and we talk about reactive on degenerative pathology that's another complex concept but if you often if you ask people about a history of symptoms say someone presents to you with an Achilles tendon and you say have you had symptoms before I say no never had symptoms what about the other leg oh that's given me a niggle occasionally and as soon as you've got it in one leg you usually got it in the other um, but you can also ask questions like um, what's it like in the morning? Is it, has it ever been stiff? Oh, yeah, it's always stiff in the morning for, you know, 30 seconds. Well, there you go. There's some clinical sort of perspective that you have an underlying degenerative tendon and what the person is presenting to you with is a reactive response in the non-degenerative part of the tendon, which is reactive on degenerative. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not being very clear. Uh, but mostly you can assume that the people you see are going to have some sort of pathology in their tendon because a true reactive tendon is relatively rare. Clinically, what should we look for in terms of if we start off with our patient history and then we're going to go into the uh, clinical assessment, what things should we look for within the patient history? So you've mentioned their morning stiffness. You've mentioned there they may have pain on the unaffected limb. So really what you want, the key clinical questions is what have you done differently that might have brought this on because there's always a history of overload of some description so it might be really simple that somebody takes up a new activity so in you know in the coronavirus sort of pandemic people are doing more exercise because that's what they're able to do so a change in activity is a really critical part of the history taking and if you can't find it, it's um, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a yellow flag that you might not be dealing with a tendon. The pe thing that people don't understand is often it's not more activity that's induced the tendinopathy. It's actually that they've had a period of unloading and they've come back to their usual load. As soon as you unload a tendon, you lose capacity in the tendon and the muscle and the kinetic chain in the brain. We talk about that as a continuum that we need to rehab. And so you might have sprained your ankle and you've had a period of three or four weeks where you're loading less, you've got less dorsiflexion range, risk factor, and then you decide that you will return to your running and you don't ramp back up. If you've had four weeks of unloading, you really pretty much need to have four weeks of reloading that's progressive. But you decide that you're going to go back to your 50 kilometres a week the tendon is not used to that. It's had a period where it's not been exposed to load. And what you consider to be your normal load is actually, in fact, excessive. And that's the key clinical question. The second thing that we use for diagnosis is that your pain is relatively localised or is localised. <clears throat> that is, 
it doesn't spread. It's in the tendon. It's usually one or two fingers that people point to and it stays there. Does it ever shift? No. What happens when you go for a run? Does it shift? No, it doesn't. So that's another really important part of your history that will give you direct clues that you're dealing with the tendon. As soon as you have a more, an unclear presentation, so it's been niggling a bit, but it's not related to load. So we would expect that if you loaded a tendon, it would be worse the next day, but it's not, you know, it niggles when you sit on the couch, you don't remember doing anything different, you know, you get a bit of ankle or knee swelling, all of those things start to make a history of not tendon. So you've really got to have your antenna up all the time when you're taking a history to sort of separate the symptoms into tendon-like and non-tendon-like. And is that regardless of whether we're looking at gluteal uh, hamstring or patella or Achilles tendon? Yeah, pretty much. So if you think about how different those um, presentations are, so your, your gluteal tendon will be in your postmenopausal woman mostly, your patella tendon will be in your young jumping men mostly. So even though they're very different in their presentation, they're actually, those those factors are relatively critical still. So glute med will be brought on mostly with a change in activity. So ladies, couples retire. They decide, certainly in Australia, they decide to pack their bags and head to Europe. They suddenly walk a lot more. You know, they carry bags a lot more. You know, they take up belly dancing or, you know, something else that, that loads the tendon. So there will be some clear change in load in those ladies. <clears throat> um, gluteal tendon pain can be a little bit more diffuse, um, but the symptoms will be clearly related to load. And <clears throat> in terms of if I walk more today, I'm worse. Yet, sorry, sorry, if I walk more yesterday, I'm worse today, that sort of thing. In the patella tendon, it's always young jumping men. It's hardly ever anybody else. And their change in load can be the coach getting cranky with them. As I say, period of time off with an ankle sprain, um, coming back to basketball training, that sort of unload, reload. Uh, it will be a very different type of activity. And, you know, if you consider the Achilles, it can be in a young sprinting athlete, an older person walking a dog. There's still going to be a relative, relative overload. There will still be relatively localised pain. There will still be a response to too much load. Um, so there's still the factors. It's just that they are at a different level. And then with that unloaded going back to loaded, is it a really strict sort of one-to-one -one of four to six weeks out will require a four to six week ramping period or? No, it's never, never absolute. Um, so if you sprain your ankle mm -hmm. and you get put in a boot for four weeks and you are on crutches and, you know, you don't have a very active recovery from your ankle sprain, then there's going to clearly be some tendon, muscle, kinetic chain and brain changes because you've had substantial underload. However, if your ankle sprain is managed actively and someone, you know, your physio gives you a good calf program, you still do your, your weights in the gym, you still do as much as you possibly can within the restrictions of your ankle sprain, then your recovery is going to be much, much quicker. Um, we know that heavy, slow resistance training maintains both muscle strength and tendon stiffness. So if you can do any sort of non-sport loading, so you're not playing your basketball, but you're loading as much as you can in, in ways that are, are sensitive to your, you know, your other injury, then you'll get back much quicker. So what we see in a lot of people that are had present with tendon issues is that they've been rested far too much. They've not been loaded enough. You know, there's been a whole range of poor clinical decisions about unloading that tendon, unloading that person. What are we going to look for in our assessment what are the things that we're looking for physically when we're assessing this person? We only ever assess, assess dysfunction. So we are looking for ability, muscle strength, muscle bulk, muscle endurance, and then the energy storage and release capacity. So we look at the leg spring a lot. We might look specifically at the tendon spring. So we know that tendons act like springs and that's the load that creates the problems for them it's not the slower activities that create grief in tendons it's the faster activities 
So we would uh, progressively load a tendon from very low loads to very high loads, and we would stop wherever we needed to along that, that continuum. Um, so if somebody's got eight out of 10 pain on a single leg calf raise, you know, in their Achilles, I'm not talking about calf pain, I'm talking about Achilles pain, we wouldn't go and jump and hop them, okay? But if they have a two out of 10 pain with uh, a single leg calf raise, we'd probably go on and look at jumping and does that increase your pain? And then hopping and does that increase your pain? And then big hops, does that increase your pain? So, and how good are you at it? It's not only a pain provocation test, but what the deficits that we're seeing. So we compare to the other leg, that's often not terrific as well, in, in certainly in people who are less active. But people who we ask to do a single leg calf raise who can't actually get their heel off the ground, they're that unloaded, they're that dysfunctional, and then they want to be, they want to walk their dog five kilometres or they want to run. So someone who can do five decent calf raises wants to run 50 kilometres a week. Well, you can't run 50 kilometres a week when you can do five calf raises. You need to have much better function. So we're not focused on imaging, not focused on palpation. We are focused purely and specifically on identifying dysfunction and fixing that. Do you ever notice anything during your physical assessment in terms of uh, tonus or atrophy in the muscles? Or is that something you mentioned there, you look more specifically at dysfunction. So do you then, not that you neglect it, but do you not give as much attention to muscle tone or atrophy in the muscles or... Yeah, muscle tone, muscle tone, no, I don't think you can assess it and I don't think it's meaningful in tendons. But atrophy, yes. So one of the key things that we see in tendons is you very, very quickly lose muscle bulk. So one of the reasons we think, and, and we need evidence for this, but tendon pain is directly linked to tendon loading. It's clear. Every single time you load your tendon, it hurts. And so your brain's very smart. It very quickly learns not to load it. And you have all sorts of strategies around uh, putting load through the other leg, other muscles, other, other tendons. And so you, in tendon pain, we very quickly lose muscle bulk. And it's a, for us a, a key examination point that if we don't see a lot of muscle wasting, we're instantly suspecting that it's not a tendon-related injury. Of course, this is different in people depending on how long they've had it. So if you're working in elite sport, it might be less of, less obvious, but certainly in the clinic, it's actually more obvious. One of the reasons we say don't see it as much in patellofemoral pain, we see we do see muscle wasting in patellofemoral pain, but it's not nearly as profound as patellotendinopathy because patellofemoral pain is less linked to load. So you can get pain with patellofemoral loading, but you get pain when you sit on the couch and you get pain when you're in bed and you get pain when you're not doing very much. And so your brain doesn't see that link as clearly. And so you unload less because you, you're not quite so quite sure. But muscle wasting and muscle atrophy is a clear indicator that you've got tendon issues. And what we find is you tend to unload below the level of the affected tendon. So if you have an Achilles, we see pretty much um, calf wasting. If you have a patella tendon, we see quads and calf wasting. If you have a gluteal tendon, we see gluteal calf and quad wasting. Um, if you have a hamstring tendon, we see hamstring calf glute wasting. So you tend to unload below the level of the affected um, tendon, and that's another really important sign. With the hamstring, what side of the hamstring are you generally expecting that to be? Is it more proximal or distal? Uh, all, nearly always proximal. Um, proximal hamstring tendinopathy is by far the most prevalent. Um, you very occasionally see distal biceps femoris tendon tendinopathy. Mostly medial side is more bursal. So you get a friction syndrome between um, semitendinosis, semimembranosis. So it isn't very common distally, probably I would be guessing less than 1% of hamstring tendinopathies are, are distal. They're nearly always proximal. And they tend to be in athletes who do a lot of forward bending, things like hockey, or in middle-aged runners who have a poor running technique or runners who do hills, who run hills. They're the three groups that tend to get a hamstring tendinopathy proximally. 
Coming back to the load, uh, you mentioned you look for the dysfunction, you look for the load that they can tolerate and sort of almost where a breaking point is for them. Now, at least when I'm working with my patients in clinic, generally speaking, what I'll say to them is, you may not have pain here and now with me. You may experience some discomfort later on in the day or tomorrow. Now, if you're looking for pain during your clinical assessment, uh, how relevant for you then is that pain afterwards in deciding on your load for what you're going to prescribe the patient? Well, okay. So first things with tendons, you have to be able to reproduce the pain with load. Okay. You must be able to provide a load that actually causes their pain. If you can't, then you have to be thinking about the differential diagnosis. What else could be the source of the pain? And that's one of the key things in the clinic that we find is at least 50% of people who are referred to us with long-term tendon pain actually don't have it. And they've been managed as a tendon. It's not a tendon. It's not done well because you're trying to manage a different condition with a tendon-like process. And that's one of the key things. But the pain behaviour is really important. So as you increase the load on the tendon with your examination, your pain should go up. Load-dependent increase in pain. But you've actually got to make sure that the load you place on it is actually causing increased load on the tendon. So, you know, that's where things like palpation are, are hopeless or low-load activities are hopeless because they actually don't put enough load on the tendon. How it behaves after activity and after your examination is really important. Classically, tendon pain warms up as you become more active and then is much worse 24 hours later. So if you uh, speak to somebody and they say, when I train, um, I don't have much pain. It's a bit stiff when I start. It gets a little bit better. It might be a bit niggly after, but my goodness, the next morning it's really bad. I can't get up and down stairs. I'm struggling to walk well. That's classic tendon pain. If you are active or you examine somebody and you induce a lot of pain and their pain goes up as they do more activity but then settles and then is not worse the next day, it can give you night pain if it's not tendon pain, um, then that's not going to be tendon related. As a clinician, you shouldn't uh, make them worse with your examination. You should be sensitive to their response to load. So if they have pain, um, with, as I said, with a slow movement, and it's quite high, then you wouldn't take them up to the faster movements. Um, so that you shouldn't make them horribly worse. You need to examine them enough to ensure that you know that it's tendon pain um, and not something else, and then bail out and get on to other things. So you've mentioned the dysfunction that you'll examine. Before we dive too far into the treatment side of things, is there anything like swelling or a squeaky tendon or something like that that you might look for? Where would that play into it? A pathological tendon is always thicker. That's the donut in the hole. Remember, that's Sean Docking's work that showed that pathological tendons are thicker. Assessing tendon swelling is really difficult because many times clinically you can't actually assess it. It's easy in an Achilles to see a swollen tendon, but the rest of the lower limb tendons, it's hard to assess clinically. You can on imaging, but we don't use imaging as a guide for anything in our clinical decision making. So, and, and, and from Sean Docking's work, we know that a thick tendon is probably a good tendon. It's a tendon that's um, responded to the pathology by forming new, new good tissue. And so it's a tendon that will usually take load. Your question about the squeaky tendon, I mean, you're talking about a peritendon issue here. So you're talking mostly foot and ankle and Achilles tendons. That's a differential diagnosis. You can't treat a peritendon like a tendon. It's completely different management. And you have to differentiate peritendon issues from tendon issues because if you don't, you will direct these people down the incorrect path. So that's very much part of a differential diagnosis issue. So if we, just from a differential diagnosis perspective, if we look at the Achilles, we can have mid-portion pain. We can have mid-portion plantaris-associated pain. We can have insertional pain. We can have um, superficial bursa pain. We can have neural pain. We can have peritendon pain. We can have pain reflected from subtalar joint, from medial and lateral tendons, from the posterior ankle. 
so many things give you pain in the region of the Achilles and poor clinicians just say, oh, well, you know, here's the picture it shows an Achilles pathology and I poke it and it feels bad, therefore it's Achilles tendon pain. You actually have to go through all of those structures and make sure you're dealing with tendon pain and not something else because if you're dealing with something else, you, your, your, tendon, your treatment will be misdirected. Okay, so then what is that treatment going to consist of? How should someone structure that treatment then? So it's really simple and it, I, I, it's just not rocket science. It, the, the devil is in how well you do it. Um, the principles are simple. You assess the, what the person's level of function and capacity is in your in your clinical examination you discuss with them what they want to achieve and then you progressively load them from what they have at the moment through to what they need to do to be successful at their activity or sport level so it's really just a progressive loading program but the skill is in identifying the dysfunction the skill is identifying what they need to be successful at their activity or sport. But the biggest skill that we lack as physios and uh, makes me so cross is exercise prescription and our ability to understand how we progressively load people. And, you know, my newest issue is that we chronically underload people, that we are frightened of load, we are... Uh, we're not sure about how load links to pain. So we tend to say, oh, well, if it's painful, you better not do anything without actually teasing that out and working out which pains are acceptable and which pains are not. Um, and, and we go back to, you know, weight bearing, um, you know, sorry, um, body weight exercises, TheraBand exercises, um, which might be great for an 80-year-old person with glute me, but it's not going to work for your younger athletes or your active athletes. So it's a progressive loading program from a strength-based start. So we do a lot of heavy, slow resistance training and then gradually increasing the energy storage and release the faster type activities on the tendon and taking that through to the faster activities at the repetitions and the frequency that you need for that person to be active. Okay, so you'd start at uh, heavy, slow resistance. Do you utilize ISOs at all or? Yes, yes, depending on the person. So isometrics are fabulous for somebody who has pain. Um, we can in the clinic and we would do as part of our assessment, the person's response to a proper isometric loading activity. There's two reasons we do that. One, if you teach them how to do it well, they can do it and control their pain at home. And the second, it's a good differential diagnosis. So if you think somebody has tendon pain and you run them through an isometric program and you don't get a response or they're unable to do it um, without substantial pain, then you go back and you reassess where you're at because it's not going to be tendon-related pain. And I would argue many of the research that shows non-responsiveness to isometric exercise is based on the fact that people in the study actually probably don't have tendon pain. Differential diagnosis is such an issue. People are put in studies and diagnosed with tendon pain with poor clinical capacity, poor clinical skills, dependence on imaging, dependence on palpation, all of the things that we've talked about. So if you don't respond to an isometric um, exercise loading protocol, think your diagnosis or think how you're doing the isometrics. That's the other thing about them is they're often not heavy enough, not long enough, not done properly enough. Um, so we use it a lot for people with tendon pain, but we will also very quickly move them on to a <coughs> heavy, slow resistance training program. So isometrics are great for tendon differential diagnosis, great for controlling pain, fabulous for in-season athletes. So people who are trying to maintain their com competition and their training with tendon pain, that isometrics before they train and play can be very beneficial. And um, what sort of milestones are you looking for uh, in order to progress someone from isos to heavy slow and then from heavy slow to dynamic? 
are there any milestones might be too strong of a word but are there any anything that we can have as a tangible thing for us in clinic to say all right now it's time to progress we would never give anybody isos in isolation we give it as an adjunct um, to control pain and to get some loading on the tendon but we would nearly always find some sort of loading protocol to go with that so that would never be a transition for us it would be part of the management in the early stages um, when do you progress from heavy slow resistance to the faster sort of activity when you have decent strength and decent strength endurance now you're not going to get muscle bulk back within eight or 12 weeks you're not going to get back to the same level as the other leg. So some people say, oh, you know, it's got to be within 10% of the other leg in terms of heavy, slow resistance. That's often much longer than that. But you want to see substantial improvements in strength and strength endurance. And that needs to reflect in function. Um, so we would, again, use a combination of what can you achieve in the gym? Oh, I started at, you know, five kilos with my, you know, calf raises. That's a silly um, way to put it but let's say that now I'm doing 25 and what are you doing on the other leg oh I'm doing about 35 but you know I'm not quite there but you know that that substantial change in capacity how many times can you do a calf raise well I started at two and now I can do 12 15 okay so we're seeing some real improvements in strength and when you ask them to do their calf raises and their hopping and all of that you get much lower levels of pain and you get much better capacity. So you can actually not look at them when they hop and go, my goodness. And this is what we do all the time. How on earth are you getting around? How on earth are you still running when there's so much dysfunction in this leg? But we start to see that improve. And then we would progress to the faster type activities, but very, very carefully. Um, so uh, we would start with just, 10 maybe 15 repetitions of very low low speed activity and wait and see if it's worse the next day and give these people very much progressive load at this point to make sure that you're not stressing the tendon they always keep up their strength work they keep up their isometrics if they need to um, so the strength work stays right through the program and right through back into their sport we usually encourage people to keep up the strength work forever while they're trying to be active um, and then as that improves um, all you do is you look to accumulate the capacity in the tendon to do the repetitions of the activity that they need so if it's a deceleration activity or if it's an acceleration activity or it's change of direction or it's jumping that you need to get that person able to do that with no flare of pain the next day um, and then you need to do it repetitively. You need to get them up to a, you know, pretty much an hour of activity, you know, three or four times a week, and then you can cut them loose and uh, you don't cut them loose. You ease them back into training. And then once they're training well, you ease them back into competition. So it's always controlled the whole way through. It's always about um, how does the tendon respond to it. It's always about progressive loading. If, it, if X is good and not flaring you the next day, X plus one is your next load. And if that's not flaring in the next day, X plus two. And so you have to be thoughtful. You can't jump around with your exercises. You have to understand what exercises, how exercises affect tendons. If you don't understand if that's a high tendon load or a low tendon load, then your exercise prescription is going to be rubbish. You're going to flare people all the time. They're going to get sick of coming back to you and saying, oh, well, you know, the exercise you gave me last time made me much worse. They'll go and find someone else. And so this is all about load, load, loading them appropriately and, and being a good clinician at every level, at assessment level, at, at exercise prescription level, at all of those things, differential diagnosis. Um, and that's what we're bad at. Okay. That was going to be my next question. Now, what tips can you give to someone working in clinic in terms of finding the right load for what's in front of them so let's take for example i've a, a patient at the moment who is uh 50 uh, in her 50s uh she's presenting with uh, what appears to be achilles tendinopathy and i'm loading her with a heavy slow resistance program um 
what would you suggest with what's in front of you in her day-to-day activities she's struggling to even run around the office at this point she's unable to do any other activities uh, in terms of sport because the pain became too much over a period of a few months okay so number one make sure it's an achilles um middle-aged ladies can have all sorts of other issues make sure it's not a peri tendon um because that's a whole different management so if she's struggling just with general walking then she will probably have really poor strength inability to do any sort of um heel raising capacity at all with these people if you can't get them to heel raise with body weight we go back to seated calf raises seated calf raises is a really good way in these people to get a load through the Achilles and the calf without the body weight. So if she can't do double leg, then drop her back into a seated calf raise. But she's got to load it all the time. Every single day she has to have some sort of load through that. I would look at what isometric loads were able to change her pain. If pain is a primary problem, you should be able to find an isometric load that helps her. And so if she can learn to control her pain with an isometric load and then you can get her into some heavy, slow resistance, remembering people think about heavy, slow resistance as, you know, kilos and kilos of weight. Heavy is heavy for that person. It might be five kilos. Um, So she may be someone who benefits from a seated calf raise program and maybe some very easy double leg calf raise. And again, it would be, Give her some stuff, see how she responds. Give her an isometric, see how she responds. So she might be someone who you would spend a bit more time in isometrics because she's got such a pain issue, but very much about getting some strength work that she can manage uh, and, you know, really pretty much getting a load on it every day. With pain that severe, if if she's, she's struggling to do very simple everyday things, um, I'd, I'd really think about maybe a contribution from another structure. Now, in the Achilles, you can have Achilles tendon pain, but you can be you can have other pain conditions on the top. So you might have some neural pain or you might have some joint-related pain. So you need to, if that's the case, you need to treat both of those. So, yeah, there'd be a lot of things. That's very much about, so it might take quite a few treatments to work out the loads that are good for this lady and the loads that are not really helpful which what's the best are you sure with your diagnosis and is there anything else contributing um so it can be a bit of a sort of suck it and see um but very systematic in how you approach it you can't be random i'll try this oh well that didn't work let's try something else you know if you find your isometrics didn't work there's going to be reasons either it's not tendon pain or you're too heavy or you're not long enough or you're not doing them properly so Rejig that, see if that helps. So it, it's really about thinking. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and at what point would we think of uh, adjunct treatments like Shockwave? And would something like that factor in, or are you not a proponent for that? Or Adjuncts are okay, and pretty much any adjunct is okay. Shockwave we tend not to use because there's some suggestion that it it's not necessarily positive for the tendon. It does help pain. No issues with that. Any adjunct that helps the person load better is okay. So if you find that you just can't load anybody, and I would argue passionately that you're just not good at getting the loading right, that you can always load somebody at some level that's going to be helpful. So if you you know, you're rehabbing your <clears throat> your lady with your Achilles and I know you won't do this, but you're trying to get her to walk five kilometres as her rehab <clears throat> and that's just too much for her and Achilles is not very good. You need to, it's a loading issue um, rather than needing to add the shockwave therapy to get her to walk a five kilometres. So that would be my first thing. But if you truly have gone through it and you're really struggling to find any sort of load that makes them... Um, able to any sort of load that helps them then use your adjuncts to try and change your pain so that you can load them Um, very rarely in a rehab 
um, situation do we need adjuncts? You know, if you get the loading right, you can rehab somebody very, very easily. Um, we tend to use adjuncts much, much more when we're trying to keep somebody training and playing that has tendon pain. <laughs> Um, so that's when they become much more important. And, of course, in clinical practice, give some never never friction tendons or, or put anything on the, you know, any sort of irritation on the tendon. Treat the muscle much more. Treat anything that might be contributing to your pain. If the person needs some sort of hands-on to make them feel better, that they're going to be more uh, adherent to your exercise program, trust you more as a clinician, then do it. And we use our adjunct treatment time, if we use it, as education. It's not about the weather. It's not about coronavirus. It's about do you understand what's happening in your tendon? Do you understand that the pathology doesn't matter? Do you understand that your imaging doesn't matter? Do you understand that you have really low function at the moment? And if you want to walk your dog five kilometres, that we actually have to get your function better. And all of these exercises, I know they're boring, but if you don't do them, we, we won't get there. And you can go down the road to the, to the other um, practitioner and, and get some magic guru-based intervention. And, yeah, sure, it's going to help you for a couple of weeks, but it's not actually going to fix your problem. So adjuncts can be helpful for the person. They can be helpful because you feel like you're doing something. Much prefer you spent time on working out your exercise prescription. But also it, it's a really good opportunity to get some education uh so just coming back to loading the tendons whether it's an achilles or if it's a patella tendon gluteal hamstring are there any differences in how you then approach loading it with heavy slow resistance or with dynamic uh in terms of how you load it and how heavy you go so that 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 comes down to what they want to achieve. Okay, so you had a lady with glute med tendon. Um, she's struggling to walk up and down stairs. She's struggling to shop. Um, she sure as heck can't do her activities and, you know, any walking type things. But that's all she wants to do. Um, she doesn't want to be a runner or a, do anything like that. So I would never consider that she would be someone I would take back to fast loading. There's, it's pointless asking her to recover a function she's never going to use because once she stops using it, she's going to lose it anyway. So there's no point. So she would be somebody who I wouldn't put in a gym because she's, you know, 60 or 70, never been in a gym before, doesn't want to go, doesn't understand, frightened of it. Um, and she doesn't need it because I can do all of her loading at home with body weight loads and, and a few other things. And, and again, that's about exercise prescription. I don't have to take her to a high level of loading because she never needs it. So that can be often really simple. Often in old, older ladies with glute med, isometric exercises fixes them. They, you know, and then we do a lot of quad and calf work as well because, remember, you lose below the level of the, the affected tendon. And if you have poor calf strength, poor quad strength, then your hip takes a hit. A, a fair hit. So we do a lot of sort of kinetic chain work in those ladies. In somebody with a patella tendon, it's going to be a young jumping man who's playing basketball or volleyball. And man, do we need massive strength. They need to be in the gym. They need to be um, strong in their quads and their calf and their glutes and their hands. And then we have to take them back to massive amounts of faster stuff, change of direction, stopping, jumping, all of the stuff that they need. So it, it, it still all comes back to that original principle I talked about. What dysfunction do they have? What function do they need to achieve? And working between the two. So there's no recipe. You know, we haven't even talked about eccentrics, but that's just lazy clinical practice. Come in, have an Achilles. This is what you do out the door. Who's next? Okay, brilliant. Nah, not, not ever recipe based in how you approach a tendon okay um coming back to these uh, let's say if we take the patella tendon and we're going to take these explosive jumping athletes uh why is it so important for us to emphasize and educate the patients on just because you're feeling good right now doesn't mean that you're going to be a hundred percent there yet to return to activity 
Yeah, okay. Um, it, it's, it's almost once you get to that point and you're starting to lose their adherence to what you want and sometimes you're trying to slow them down all the time and they want to go and do a two-hour training session when you're asking them to train for 45 minutes because they're just back into training. Um, and they always do, you know, their teammates are around, the coach is there. If you've spent the time on education up to there and they get really sore the next day, they will come to you and say, guess what I did? You know, you told me to train 45 minutes and I trained for two hours and now I'm really sore. Guess what? I overloaded. I'm stupid. And so it's really about putting the responsibility back onto them. You can't be the gatekeeper of their activity. You actually have to show them what their tendon is capable of and allow them to make the decisions um, because then it takes the effort off you. If you try and take responsibility for everybody's injury you see, you'll be exhausted at the end of every day. This, this is your tendon. This is your issue. This is what I'm telling you to do. If you do too much, this is what's going to happen. If you do too little, this is what's going to happen. Um, own it. This is what I'm advising. Uh, you can pretty much choose what you want to do. Um, I, you know, I do care. I, you know, it's not my tendon, okay? It's your tendon. Go away and do it. Um, so that's, that's a critical thing. The second thing that we always educate them with is once a tendon, always a tendon. So this is not going to go away. We can make you pain-free and functional. But if you misbehave, it'll come back. So if you do too much, you'll get tendon pain. If you unload and then reload, you'll get tendon pain. What we need you to do for the rest of your activity in life, be that walking the dog or playing basketball, is maintain a load on that tendon that's consistent. If you maintain a consistent load on a tendon, it's usually happy. It's change in loading that we talked about the very first question. That's the thing that upsets tendons. So... The person needs to understand that. You can't sit like a leprechaun on their shoulder for the rest of their career and say, good load, bad load, good load, bad load. They have to work that out. They have to be the ones that come in dragging their knuckles on the floor and say, I'm much worse and I'm, I did this and that's why I'm much worse. Or I'm not getting any better, but I haven't done what you've asked me um, I understand, can you just hit me over the knuckles and I'll get on with it, that sort of thing. So there's lots of things you can do. Okay, I think there's two big things there. The, the first one would be, um, what is it about the healing process of the tendon? Uh, and I think this might be one of the questions that you mentioned earlier is something hopefully we as physio should understand already. What it is about? What is it about the tendons healing process that this is going to be continually an issue? So this may be something that factors into the donut model. And then the second element I think would be how much conditioning work should someone do if they're a young active athlete alongside their sport then, or if it is someone who just wants to be able to walk the dog pain free. What could we recommend? All right, so um, in terms of healing, tendons don't heal pretty much. Um, so the pathology stays exactly the same. What you do with your rehab program is condition the tendon, the muscle, the kinetic chain and the brain to taking the load that it needs to. Now we know we get mechanically stiffer, so the tendon becomes stiffer. That allows it to store and release energy better. We know we get the muscle stronger. That allows it allows it to control the tendon spring better. We know that we get the kinetic chain better. That allows the, the load to be distributed across the whole limb and all of the muscles and not just focused on one thing. And we know from a brain perspective that we decrease cortical inhibition, improve motor excitability. So the whole thing has to change for it to be um, effective. But it's not about healing the tendon. If you... If person is expecting, we see this, people come in with serial imaging and image one looks the same as image 10. It doesn't change very much. You have to educate people. Well, that's not going to change. We're not going to continue to image your tendon because it's not going to get any better. But, hey, can you hop better? Oh, yes, you can. Do you have less pain in the morning? Oh, yes, you do. Okay. They are our markers of improvement. It's not about anything else. And if you can get that in early in terms of people's understanding, 
then they will buy into the markers of improvement that you consider important. Um, so often people come in with, you know, diagnosis of a partial tear or a longitudinal split, put it to bed straight away. It doesn't matter. It's not changing our treatment. It's not changing our capacity to get you better. Um, so it's so much about education. Um, and of course, you know, people say, why do we, why do tendons become a, a continual issue? It's no different from muscle. So if you sit on the couch and uh, do nothing and then decide you're going to run, you're going to have muscle stiffness, DOMS, delayed muscle soreness, in every single muscle group in your, your, your legs and probably your arms and, and, and core as well. I hate that word. Um, you know, the thing with muscles is they respond to overload or excess load as well. The problem is, or the, the benefit of them is they get better relatively quickly and they give you a clear signal that they're overloaded and a clear signal when they're better. Tendons often just ease along with it getting a little bit worse and a little bit worse. And so before, by the time that you get to the point where you can't do things, it's been there for a couple of months and you've got all the unloading strategy. And bone's a bit the same. So you can accumulate stress in a bone area with too much overload um, and you don't feel it until you actually have stress reaction, stress fracture. So it's not different to other muscle, other musculoskeletal tissues. It, you know, it's just a bit slower and a little less clear about its, its capacity to tolerate load. Um, so it stays an issue because you have a pathology, it needs to to stay strong you have to keep these people exercising um, you never rest a tendon all of the things that we've talked about um, so your second part of your question is uh, conditioning these people we advocate for twice a week strengthening um, and simple strengthening you know calf raises you know seated calf raises leg extensions leg press hip machine hamstring machine all of those things twice a week forever now if it's a little old lady who's walking her dog, I don't know why it's always a little old lady, but anyway, um, little old lady walking her dog, she just needs to do some single leg calf raises twice a week. So we're not going to put her in the gym as we talked about, but we have to keep the strength up um, and the capacity because, you know, you even as you rehab people, the brain, I think, probably maintains some sort of inhibitory drive for quite a long time. I reckon it's about 12 months. So... You get pain in your tendon. Your brain says, stupid idea. Let's not load. So inhibitory drive, you start to come along, you rehab them, you know, you, you, you decrease the inhibitory drive. But if you don't keep up the strength work, I think the inhibitory drive can take over again. So I've seen this in athletes. They stop their strength work. They lose all their strength pretty quickly just because they haven't done it for long enough. So we advocate forever. I think it's at least 12 months. You have to keep some sort of, you know, reasoned loading on it, um, particularly the muscle tendon unit. Okay, yeah. Um, now, I had uh, or had have a, uh, a youngish girl in her twenties who was very active, doing a lot of volleyball, uh, and she went abroad for PRP treatment. Where do you stand on something like that? Ah, how, many, how many more hours do we have? Okay, whole, whole load of issues around that. A 20-year-old girl is very unlikely to have patella tendon pain. She's much more likely to have patella femoral pain. This is a differential diagnosis issue. She could easily have pathology in her tendon. So we talked about the patella tendon being different. This is likely a disease of maturation. So too much load as the tendon is trying to mature. Um, so it's not a load accumulation disease like the other tendons, so it's quite different. Um, so mostly pain in young girls is patellofemoral, even if they have anterior knee pain that's relatively localised, it won't be tendon-based pain. So that's the first thing. She's probably having PRP in a pathology that's not necessarily the source of the pain. Okay, we've talked about the pathology not healing. It really does not matter what you do, it won't heal. You can fry it, you can bake it, you can inject, you know, cat's wee into it. I actually don't care. It's not going to change the pathology. And the pathology is not the source of the pain because we know that you can have pain-free pathology. You know, 40% of people playing 
top level basketball have pathology in their patellar patella tendons and don't have pain. So if you can have pathology with no pain, why are we treating the pathology? It doesn't change and it may not be the source of pain. So it, it's it's nonsensical aside from making money for a lot of people, a lot of money for a lot of people. Um, the thing that changes pain is improving the capacity of the muscle tendon, connected chain and brain in a progressive way and restoring function so that when she goes to play her, her volleyball, her tendon, her muscles can know they can do that. They have the capacity to do that. That's what changes pain. Anything else is just uh, a waste of time. It's really interesting. It's, it's really interesting you... Uh... You mentioned the patella femoral pain, so I probably should have uh, made mention of the fact that uh, when she went abroad, this was four years ago that she got the PRP, so she was 16 even, so that might tick you off even more. Oh, yep. uh, so she was 16 when this happened, and now when she's come to see me, what I want to do with, with her knee is treat her more for the patella femoral pain, because I see for myself looking at her that there's more of an issue in in the kinetic chain loading it as well rather than focusing just on the knee and the tendon so that makes me smile inside as well that uh <laughs> hopefully i'm on on the right track for her but uh yeah it's it's interesting how it can be so mismanaged and the, the prp itself she said she only had temporary relief and as, yeah, within a short time frame, everything was right back to where it was. Um, I was just, yeah, sort of interested on on your view and opinion of something like that. But yeah, yeah, no. Yep. The patella tendon is one tendon where you can't have a bit of everything. So nearly every other tendon, you can have tendon pain, plus a little bit of neural pain, plus a little bit of joint pain. In the patella tendon, it's either tendon or patella femoral joint. It's not a mix of both. That's that's a, a, a that's a cop out. Um, and as I say, we hardly ever see it in girls. The only girls we see it in are really, really elite, excellent jumpers. Um, nearly always in men, and even in men, it's most commonly um, patellofemoral pain. So the number of young jumping men we see diagnosed with a tendinopathy based on imaging or palpation is outrageous. And they don't get better with a tendon-based loading program because they need a, a, a proper patellofemoral type of program. Uh, all of these adjunct treatments will make you feel better. A lot of them are directed, um, actually have an impact on the neural, the, you know, the neural input to the brain. So you actually block or, or ameliorate the, the pain signals to the brain. I don't, no, they're not pain signals. They're nociceptive drive. I'm hopeless at this. Nociceptive drive to the brain. So they change it either directly, so some, something like polydocanal is neurotoxic, so it changes the capacity of the nerve to send nociceptive drive. But very often they, they, they have an injection and they have asked to rest for three weeks. Well, tendon pain gets better if you rest it. It's only when you return to loading that's actually worse because you've actually unloaded and then you're reloading, so you're actually worse. So often it's, it, it's two things. One, it comes with a period of rest. Second, it can change the nociceptive drive. Um, all we know is that rest makes them worse and nociceptive drive, it, it recovers. And so, you know, sometimes they'll give you, so shockwave therapy will change nociceptive drive, but it'll be back within days or weeks um, as the nerve recovers. Realistically, if you are to use something like uh, shockwave then or one of the other adjuncts, it's best to be used as not a, a cure but maybe something to just temporarily relieve pain so that you can work on it properly and loading the tendon. Yep. It's an adjunct. Yep. It's not a treatment. It's, it's something that allows you to get either better athlete buy-in, makes you feel better. Sometimes a lot of what we do just makes a physio feel better, makes them feel like they're doing something but you're much better doing a better exercise prescription than you are, you know, stroking something basically. Um, and it, it, you know, if it makes someone feel a couple of hours relief, that's great. But you have to be clear that this is not a treatment. This is an adjunct. This is not what's going to make you better in the long run. Okay. Are there any sort of learning moments that you've had over your years of research and also in clinic that you can share with us? Any sort of gems that you took forward from uh, 
something that didn't go so well with a patient? I think we've been much more uh, clear on the role of differential diagnosis from having repeated failures of people getting better and learning that you have to be such so on task to make sure you've got you know how much the tendon is contributing to the pain um so you know a series of failures always makes you better i think over the last 20 years our reliance on imaging has just got less and less and less um you know i'm old enough to have been around when ultrasound was first available in tendons and you know all of the the hype around, well, look at all this pathology. If it's a pathology, we must have surgery. And my PhD was actually saying, well, hang on, pathology actually doesn't mean anything. And um, over the years, we've got less and less reliant on imaging. We, we almost never, ever do it now. We don't need to because our clinical skills are good enough that we can differentially diagnose things well and we can manage um, most things. And if you have MRI, say you don't know where the pain is in the anterior knee pain, you don't know if it's patellofemoral or patella tendon. You, have an, you think, oh, great, I'll have an image and I'm going to decide what it is. Well, you find patellofemoral changes and you find tendon changes and you might find some swelling and you might find a plica. You still don't know what the source of the pain is. So it doesn't actually help you anyway to discriminate what's going on. It has to be clinical. You have to work out when you load a structure how you know, that influences their pain and that's what your decision making is. So better at differential diagnosis, less reliant on imaging, um, latest rave, rant, um, unloading, exercise prescription unloading. We've talked about it, but we see people, we can see someone um, with two-year two year history of Achilles pain who's never been given a calf exercise never been given a calf exercise seen five six seven different practitioners what are they doing oh goodness only knows uh, you know i don't want to know because i just don't sleep at night because it makes me so angry that someone's had two years of pain and no one's actually loading but not loading is is an issue but underloading is our biggest issue you know theraband based exercises and you know poor poorly um poorly uh, monitored calf raises and double leg calf, double leg you know double leg work is is a waste of time if you have an affected muscle tendon unit it will hide if you do double leg have to be single leg you know the fact that i can't convince a strength and conditioning person to do an isolated exercise you know they don't believe leg extensions are a valid exercise they're the only exercise that helps patella tendons um you know, that it has to be in a kinetic chain for it to be functional and it has to be double leg to be functional. Well, no, it doesn't actually. Um, you know, if, if this is rehab, not, not you know, performance-based, um, you know, training age. Oh, well, you can't put a 15-year-old on a leg extension machine. Yes, you can. Um, yeah, I just get incredibly cranky. But, you know, the people we see are not the people that, you know, I'm, that your your listeners see in terms of these are very often people presenting for the first time. I see people who've spent thousands of dollars on tendon, you know, been overseas to get PRP injections or stem cell injections, you know, seen practitioners that have told them stupid things, you know, Googled everything to within an inch of its life and they've not, you know, not found a solution because that's just confusing going to, into the internet to look for a solution and, you know, you, you come out, completely and utterly confused about what's going on um that's what frustrates me okay so i i think to now my biggest takeaway thus far uh also from listening to the other pods and your research is realistically like you said at the beginning the tendon pain isn't rocket science but you have to be certain that you're dealing with tendon pain and then find the right load. If you're not dealing with tendon pain and you're loading it as a tendon, uh, whatever the issue may be, then it's quite clear as to why someone may not be responding, why someone may not be developing as quickly or in the right way that you'd hope. Absolutely. 
you know, 50% of what we see is exactly that people presenting with perineal tendinopathy that's actually perineal tendinopathy post ankle sprain. It, it, it's not likely it can happen, it's not likely, but it's posterolateral ankle impingement that's the issue. Um, patellofemoral pain diagnosis, patella tendinopathy, classic, you know, gluteal tendon is, is a nightmare. It, it's in women who may have hip OA, it's in women who may have um, low back pain issues um, it's you know there's so many differential diagnoses around hamstring tendon exactly the same sciatic nerve sits right next to the hamstring tendon you know it can it can be a factor um, in, in it so every in, and the groin I'm not I don't even talk about groin usually but how many differential diagnoses do we have around adductor related um, groin pain um, so you need to spend your time on getting a good clinical, good history, good clinical examination, get your diagnosis right and make sure it's confirmed with every single thing you do. So say you think you've got, you've done all great history, great physical examination, think you have a tendon, you give them an isometric protocol so they know what to do when they go home and it doesn't work or it makes them worse. That makes you think, well, what's going on here? Either you're not right with your isometrics or it's not tendon pain. So it has to be confirmed all the time. They have to come back after four weeks of strength work and say, gee, I feel so much better. If they come back after four weeks of strength work and say, oh, gee, I don't know if I'm doing this right, your exercise prescription is wrong or you're not, you're not dealing with a tendon. So people will always come back and say, God, I can't believe how much better I am since you gave me some strength work. Um, and then you start to think, yay, I'm actually on the right track here and you can guide them through. Um, but, yeah. Something you mentioned earlier about loading for the patella tendon uh, was something like the leg extension would be great for it as it's a way that you can directly load over the tendon. Now, uh, I know for myself, one of the big struggles that I have is, although a lot of the people that I see might play amateur sport, they don't necessarily go to the gym. So we use things like wall squats or Spanish uh, squats to load it. However, I am cognizant that doing a wall squat isn't quite the same load or a Spanish squat isn't quite the same load uh, as being able to use the leg extension machine. What uh, sort of exercises would you prescribe to someone who may not be able to get to the gym or doesn't get to the gym to, to work out, let's say? So it just d d varies tendon by tendon. If it's patella tendon, and you're sure it's patella tendon, remembering it's a relatively rare diagnosis. Um, it'll be a young jumping man who actually is highly active. If this is non negotiable for me, go and buy a three month membership and let's get you better. We can't get you better with, with weight, um, weight bearing type exercise. We just can't get enough load through it. Um, and wall squats are a waste of time. Wall squats are great for patellofemoral pain, will not affect the tendon. If wall squats make you better, it's probably patellofemoral. Spanish squats are great load, but they're massive loads. You know, they're really, really hard. It's almost too hard, and, and you don't really have subtle enough progressions in Spanish squats to actually get people better. It has to be double leg. You can't do single leg Spanish squat. Um, so they become really difficult as well. You know, for that person, you know, it's a straight out, it's a straight out discussion day one. Look, we can get you better. You need to be based in the gym. It's only three months. Let's get you strong and three months because we need to calf load them. We know that calf is a massive shock absorber in, in the lower limb. We have to have calf strength in the in pelotendinopathy. Um, we can't do it. You know, if that that's it, you, you know, we can do it quick, more quickly if you're in the gym. If it's somebody who's older, if it's a different tendon, we can get by mostly with non-gym-based activities, you know, bridging and, and all that sort of stuff for a hamstring tendon, single double leg, you know, supported, non-supported, all of those sorts of things. Um, Achilles, we can get by with body weight loads, but in athletes, we can't. You know, in, you know we expect our athletes with Achilles to actually 
single leg calf raise one and a half times their body weight. So their body weight plus one and a half times their body weight, you know, one time, one time at least. So we're talking 70, 80 kilos for these people to be, to have the strength to get back to high load activities. You can't do that at home. You can't sit your grandchild on your knee or on your shoulders and, and, and do your exercises. So it's about having that frank discussion um, day one. We can fudge this. And we can get you a bit better, but to really get you better, you have to be in the gym. I don't think not wanting to go to the gym is a reasonable excuse. Um, very often we take people to the gym for their first one. We point out the machines. We video what they have to do. If they're not familiar, you actually have to expose them and make them familiar and then support them through it um, as they get into it. The number of people we see that become gym rats after a while is, is amazing. The, 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 the the general benefit from strength and conditioning, we know this, general benefits in activities of daily life in function are so massive that um, people actually become quite um, supportive of it. Uh, I think it's just a discussion you have to have. Are there any sort of reading recommendations then that you'd have for people to uh, yeah, get a little bit more information around the topic and also I think to help with the differential diagnoses maybe? <laughs> oh goodness well look we've written a lot about this um so anything sometimes the book chapters are better than the research papers so the research papers are constrained by you know research protocol and, and what journals will publish but in a book chapter you can have a little bit more leeway you can actually talk about your clinical perspective so we've written many book chapters that encompass both our clinical um, perspective as well as our research perspective and so have a lot of other authors who um, who who manage tendons and work in the tendon area and research in the tendon area um, everybody's a little bit different about how they approach things you know not everybody believes the continuum model not everybody thinks that heavy slow resistance is the best thing a lot of people still use just eccentric based loading um, so there's so much variation out there. I think you have to read enough so that you feel comfortable with the principles that underpin what people say. Um, so if you read my approach and think, oh, that makes no sense to me, it's pretty much pointless you're following it because you're not going to follow it properly and you're not going to get the outcomes that you want. So you might find somebody else who advocates a different, slightly different approach or a dramatically different approach that you find beneficial. Um, but it's really about what happens when you work with your athletes and your, your clinician, uh, with your patients in the clinic. So I, I would advocate trying, reading and then trying and then rereading and trying. Um, I can't be more specific. I can't say go and read chapter five in, you know, X book. There's millions of them out there. I think that's a better place for, for especially younger clinicians to start because your research papers are so confounded by um, the research question, the population, all that sort of stuff. Okay, grand. And have you any tidbits of knowledge for the listeners at all? <laughs> Gems of advice? Oh, I think I've, I've pretty much ranted about everything that I want. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the answer is, this is something Ebony Rio says, is don't let people bring their diagnosis to you. Start at point one. Start at the basics. So people will come in and say, oh, I've got an Achilles tendon problem. And you go, okay, let's, you know, treat your Achilles tendon. No, 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 no. Go back and start at the start and make sure you actually have an Achilles tendon problem uh, because people will come in having seen repeated, you know, different practitioners and people will just pick up on what they're told. Um, you have to be a thorough and good clinician to sort out these more complex things. And in fact, to sort out the simple things, if you take the shortcut with the palpation and the imaging and the eccentric program, chuck them out the door, look, you'll get some people better, but you, you're going to fail most people. I, I just would advocate for being a better clinician. If you've got a couple of minutes, actually, you mentioned Ebony Rio there. Where do you think the tendon neuroplastic training can factor into this rehab yep wherever you want it to be it's a, it's a, an adjunct but it's an adjunct that can actually really help 
the brain part of things. For our older person who's walking the dog, not worth the effort. For our younger person or our athlete, so it can be an older athlete, who wants so quickly to get back to um, their sport, you know, you're advocating a three to six month program. They want to be back in two months. Throw everything at them. So throw the throw the brain stuff at them because that will improve the drive to the to the muscle, and you'll get a better response. Throw isometrics at them because they decrease body formation. So um, you would pick your patient if it's an effort to even get them to understand the basics. Don't go there. It's just too hard. But if people are keen and understand and engaged and want it to be quick, then it can be a, a huge benefit. For anyone listening, would you be able to just uh, describe what the uh, TNT is? Okay. So what we know in tendons, and we talked about tendons um, causing unloading and, and inhibition. So we know that the motor excitability is different in people with tendon pain we know that the inhibition is stronger in people with tendon pain. So the TNT, the isometrics help the inhibition. So that's a good reason to do them. The TNT is a way of uh, targeting the excitability. And the thing that seems to improve excitability is auditory cues. So there's been some great work um, by some sports scientists that showed that your cortical drive to your muscle is better if you supplement strength exercise with auditory or visuomotor cues. So if you listen to a very boring metronome as you do your strength work, so you make it a skilled task rather than um, just, just a strength task, you, you'll get stronger when you do strength work, you get better motor drive when you do strength work with auditory or visuomotor cues. Okay, grand. Thank you very much. Um, and where can people find you if they wanted to find out and keep up to date with your work? You can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very, very low key because I, yeah, <laughs> for, for good reasons. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a privacy freak and I'm not a very good social media or web paced person. I have a Twitter account um, and I do answer questions on Twitter. Um, if you're if you have a very targeted question, not Jill like the one I got the other day, Jill, can you tell me about Achilles tendinopathy, please? That was an email from the other day. Uh, so, How lovely! <laughs> if you have a really targeted question, I'm really happy to respond to email. I'm at Trove Mini. You can find that. But I'm not going to do case studies. I'm not going to go. I've got a man with a this and a that, and he's not that. You know, that's just not possible over email. Um, but I'm really happy to help out with directed questions mm -hmm. and that's through Twitter or through email, anything else you might find. Them. Okay. Brand. Well, thank you very much. Any, uh, I suppose it is Corona time, but any plans in the future of any, uh, talks or anything that you're going to be doing, uh, further down the year? Yeah. Everything keeps getting cancelled. So I was meant to be in, well, um, I had a thing in June, a thing in October, both being cancelled, a thing in November being cancelled, December probably will be cancelled. Um, next year, I've got four or five conferences, but I'm not even going to think about telling you about those because they could all be cancelled as well. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Lots of podcasts, that sort of stuff but all saying the same thing. I mean, I keep saying the same thing to people. I, I, I don't really understand why it's such a problem for people. It's, it's not hearing what I say. It's putting it into practice. That's hard. Mm, absolutely. Well, look, Jill, thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate you being able to sit down with us. And uh, yeah, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time. As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time, peace.